from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Let me first uh, uh, welcome you to the library, to the Jefferson Building. I'm John Haskell, director of the Kluge Center. Our offices are right through the doors over here, and we're so happy you came. Uh, I want to start by introducing Yasmina Siud, who's the deputy head of press and public diplomacy for the delegation of the European Union to the United States. Yasmina? Right here. I was waiting. Where is she? Can I move this? Yes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be at the Kluge Center today to hear Kluge fellow Davide Ceriani, hope it's good pronunciation, uh, presenting his research on uh, this fascinating topic, the growth of Italian-American culture through opera until the 1940s. I myself was not a Kluge fellow. <laughs> But I also had the chance as a master's student in the US to uh, take advantage of the Library of Congress uh, and its wealth of documents and materials. So I, I know how important this is. Uh, today's program is a signature event at the, of the European Month of Culture, uh, resulting from a collaboration between the Kluge Center, the delegation of the European Union, the Italian Embassy, and the Italian Cultural Institute. As you may know, or not, the European Month of Culture is organized every year uh, by the European delegation uh, for the month of May and for the past six years, and it offers a full month of cultural events, highlighting the diversity and the innovation uh, cultures of all our 28 uh, countries that are members of the European Union. This year, we had close to 100 events. Uh, in the Washington area with participation of all our 28 embassies and multiple US cultural and educational institutions. So I would like here uh, to extend the EU delegation uh, deepest appreciation to the Kluge Center for what is now our third year collaboration um, in this EU Month of Culture. So thank you, Dr. Haskell, for your support and for the excellent work done by Travis Hensley. I don't know where he is, uh, but we look forward to many more years of cooperation. And now I leave the floor to, yes, Dr. Haskell for your conversation. Before we get to our multimedia show, which uh, will be led by Dr. Serioni over here. Let me, let me just say a uh, word or two about the Kluge Center. Uh, we bring in scholars in the humanities and social sciences by appointment of the librarian or by competitive processes to take advantage of the library collections. And we're really pleased that this event fe featuring Davide Siriani, who is a Kluge Fellow, uh, is a part of the European Month of Culture. Uh, first, let me uh, recognize Emmanuel Amandola. Is Emmanuel here yet? He's not. Well, he's the. <laughs> uh, we have a long standing relationship with the director of the Italian Cultural Institute, uh, as well as with the Embassy of Italy, and we're grateful for that relationship and, and its continuation. Um, let me uh, turn to Dr. Seriani, who I will who I will invite up in a second, but I put my notes about his career. It's too long for me to remember. <laughs> He's an assistant professor of musicology at the Department of Music at Rowan University. That's in Glassboro, New Jersey. He received his PhD in musicology from Harvard in 2011. Dr. Seriani earned his degree in saxophone at the Conservatory at Bologna in his native Italy in 1999 and his laurea cum laude at the University of Florence in 2003. Throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, he performed extensively as a saxophone player in Italy, France, and in the United States. Prior to working at Rowan, he spent two years, 2011 to 13, as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Music at Columbia University. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Seriani to the... <laughs> Right. 
Let me start with uh, a very general question so that we can learn a little bit more about the star of the show tonight. Uh, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your background. So, originally from Florence, and uh, uh, so I lived there uh, throughout uh, high school, and then at some point, even though I was at uh, the University of Florence, but then I started uh, moving around, and so uh, through these European Union uh, uh, programs, the Erasmus, the Leonardo, then I lived in, uh, in France, in Germany a bit, and then here uh, in the United States. And uh, uh, as a part of this uh, constant uh, journey for both personal and uh, professional reasons, uh, I realized uh, that uh, overall there were, I don't know, three words, I would say, three concepts that uh, always uh, uh, stood with me. And they were like identity, first, that is uh, who you are, how you define yourself, depending on uh, uh, the, the, so where, whatever um, you go. Um, then a matter of uh, alterity, that is being the other, how the others view you in this new context where you uh, decide to, to live, and then acceptance, that is uh, how you negotiate with the issue of uh, identity and uh, alterity, so your uh, identity uh, versus who you are um, versus uh, what this new environment uh, uh, is. And uh, uh, to an extent, I would say that uh, uh, this became uh, autobiographical research because I realized that uh, Italians immigrating here, uh, although in a totally different context, but did a very similar thing. So uh, you, you, I guess it goes without saying that you're, uh, that you developed an interest, of, an intense interest in opera. And, and you know, in the United States, when you're, when you're a boy growing up, like my father used to take me before I can even remember to baseball games at old DC Stadium here. And so somehow or another, he was inculcating this obsession with baseball that continues to today for no particularly good reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you get involved in opera? Was, was it something that your parents uh, groom you into that? No, that not way? at all. Uh, or better, it's not <laughs> that at all. I have nothing to do or very little to do with the music. I mean, my father has a vague interest in uh, opera, but not really. No, I wasn't really one of these uh, kids who start playing at the age of five, six. Uh, you know, it mm -hmm. took me quite, uh, quite a while, around 16, I started playing. Uh, and in particular, a saxophone, again, as you mentioned earlier. So um, at the beginning, it wasn't even a uh, main interest interest in opera. I listen to opera, but not really as a professional interest. And then by going to the conservatory, by uh, uh, playing, I started meeting uh, singers, uh, attending opera performances, and that's how it uh, all started. Even though, I have to say, by going um, abroad and uh, having people asking me about uh, uh, opera, the operatic repertory, especially the uh, Italian composers, uh, um, again, made me even more aware of how the others viewed me as an Italian, as sort of interested in opera, perhaps, by default. And so that kind of vague interest I had in the beginning developed in something, uh, yeah, more... Uh, so, so, you know, we, you obviously drew a good crowd with the, with the topic. Um, so uh, maybe this is an obvious question, but I'd like to hear your answer as to to uh, why what you're working on here at the library, why the topic of this, of this session, uh, why do you think that's important to us? What, why does that matter? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, it's important primarily to better um, discuss uh, a crucial period in uh, the history of migration to this country and, of course, the, the history of, um, of Italy. But also because I realized that in the uh, secondary literature that uh, there was a lot on the, the socioeconomic accomplishments of uh, the Italians here in the US, but not really as much about uh, um, opera itself. In other words, uh, so when, uh, um, so when, uh, when Italians um, came here, they pretty much worked uh, through, in, so for example, the, the, um, they brought with them their own uh, uh, language, which is, of course, an important factor in defining your own identity, but it can also be an uh, isolating factor. And indeed, some of them kind of isolated themselves in these uh, little Italy's and didn't even need to, to get out of them. 
Uh, food, of course, it's another important topic, and here I'm going to start through a few books that I, I read, I studied for this uh, uh, research. Simone Cinotto, for example, has written some uh, wonderful essays on the importance of uh, uh, food. Um, Simona Frasca uh, wrote uh, this uh, book on uh, the diaspora of uh, Neapolitan musicians in New York. Although she, as many other major uh, scholars of uh, uh, Italian music uh, in the US, they primarily focused on the Neapolitan repertory in the US. This, this uh, popular repertory, which was uh, hugely uh, successful, she has one chapter on Caruso, but Caruso uh, primarily performing uh, um, um, these uh, uh, Neapolitan songs. So I realized that uh, there was a spot missing there. It was exactly what opera meant for the Italians, particularly in the Northeast. I would say Boston through uh, Washington, which was the area where Italians primarily uh, right. uh, lived. And so that's how I realized that it was very important and the Library of Congress had a huge amount of uh, materials uh, to, to mm. work on this topic. Yeah. So um, are there other specific ways that, that, uh, that opera was relevant to immigrants and um, and, and before that, you know, you, 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 I guess generally the mass migration is what, 1880 or so? Yeah. Uh, in, into the, getting into the early to middle decades of the 20th mm -hmm. century. Um, what in particular, did opera mean anything in the United States before Italians came? I would say it did, but uh, um, it, in a different way. So I mean, before uh, the, 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 the 1880s, uh, 1870s, uh, uh, Americans had uh, this uh, sort of dreamy, romantic view of, uh, of Italy, thanks to some diaries of uh, Americans who traveled through Italy. And so they, they, they wrote them, and a lot of people here uh, read about it. So Amphitheatre came up with uh, this uh, uh, great quote with the love, and said, all through the 19th century, the classical buildings of Greece and Rome exerted a strong fascination on American art architects, courthouses, state legislators, railroad uh, stations, uh, um, and uh, the dwellings of the wealthy were erected with the imposing pillared facades and pediments that uh, characterized Greek and Roman temples. Um, and for example, there were even not only American architects who were influenced by the architecture of Italy, but uh, some Italian artists came here. Ciracchi, for example, uh, came here with the idea of building a big statue of Washington. He came up with this bust because he failed to secure all uh, the um, necessary funds. Uh, Brumidi he was the author of the fresco, The Apotheosis of Washington, uh, here in the US Capitol, next uh, uh, door. Uh, and the first performance uh, um, of an opera in its entirety, in its original language, uh, was uh, in Italy one. It was Rossini, the barber of Sevilla. Spalmer spell like il barbiera de Sevilla, more or less. OK, well, we get what, uh, what it is. Um, and uh, uh, following that performance, uh, many other major cultural figures uh, in New York, including, of course, uh, Da Ponte, the, the author of the Liberty for uh, Three of most important Mozart operas, uh, promoted this uh, art form. And uh, um, eventually, this, uh, over the decades, became a more and more uh, popular type of entertainment. Uh, this book, uh, Opera on the Road. This is, this uh, is well before the, the mass migration. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, the importance of these uh, uh, two books uh, discussing opera before the mass migration is that uh, so Catherine Preston basically argues that, uh, quite convincingly, that uh, the American elite, especially New York, tried to make uh, um, opera you know, an elitist sort of uh, type of entertainment. But they failed because uh, they essentially they did not have enough uh, wealth, enough money to run the operas by themselves. And because here the state support that existed in Europe uh, sort of did not exist, uh, then they had to draw in a lot of the people, the, the poorer people, uh, making the prices affordable. And that's how Karen Alquist argues that there was democracy at the opera. Because even though you would see the different classes at the opera, but you also need uh, this, no, uh, everyone in there. And that's part of my key argument, that is, uh, before the mass migration, attending opera was uh, primarily uh, about uh, class. When it comes 
to, to uh, after or during the mass migration period, it becomes a matter of race or better ethnicity. That is, uh, a lot of these ethnic groups, including the Italians, as I'll show later, they show, showed up to support their uh, folks, and that's uh, part of this major uh, change they have. So this is pretty much what happened uh, in the 19th century. This music academy was established in 1884. Uh, um, um, throughout 1850s, 60s, throughout the 80s, uh, Italian opera was really the uh, dominant uh, uh, type of uh, repertory until we get to the 1880s and um, when, to make the story short, uh, the Academy of Music was challenged by what nowadays we call the Met Opera. By the way, Met Opera, not the one we see nowadays, but the one that stood at Broadway in 1940, the old buildings. And uh, even though at the beginning both opera houses performed Italian opera, at one point, uh, or right at the beginning, those who ran the Met Opera said, why don't we try to change um, the focus? And they started primarily performing German opera, focusing on Wagner, but why? Because they knew that, uh, especially in New York at the time, there were about 250,000 people of German heritage who would be totally willing to support this repertory. And this is how this seven year period of the Germanized Opera House started. Later on, so on the, mm -hmm. on the, when people were going to Italian opera in the middle decades of the 19th century, were they, when, when you got a program, do you know if it, what, what, was it, were there translations? They, was it more, mm, more just about the pageantry? And, no, no, I mean, they, they, um, so there were various levels of uh, uh, commitments, but um, I would say that uh, they knew of uh, uh, the, the, the basic of uh, uh, the, the story, most of the people who attended it. Uh, there were certainly some uh, translations of uneven quality, but uh, for sure people made the effort. And a lot, uh, yeah, depending on uh, um, what, uh, what class you uh, belonged to. Obviously, the, the, the wealthiest, even though the, the owners, I would say, of that uh, opera house would uh, uh, have a better understanding and appreciation. But one aspect that really uh, I, I was particularly impressed by that uh, uh, concerning the interest that people had in opera. In, uh, the, um, in the Northern California area, during the gold rush, during a period when 90 to 95% of people were men living there, opera was hugely popular. And it's incredible how much people wanted opera, how many singers uh, traveled there. And so if that was the situation in an area that still had to be uh, urbanized, uh, can you imagine the kind of interest that uh, existed in New York and Philadelphia here in Washington uh, and mm -hmm. so on? So, um Slight switch of gears, so we're now we're, we're getting into the period of the, of the mass migration, so we have a lot of Italians, Italian-Americans. Um, do you have examples when, you know, you've been researching here at the library on how the, the press here and the music critics, uh, and, as well as the, you know, frankly, the Italian press and music critics reacted in those days during the mass migration to singers and opera more generally? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, uh, yes, I do, and we'll, I'll show some pictures in a moment. But before we do that, uh, yeah. I wanted to show this uh, uh, list of critics. Um, the first three, Fink, Henderson, and Krebiel. Uh, so, as, so these were the, the five most important uh, music critics uh, in the United States. Uh, well, primarily, obviously, we are talking about the uh, East, uh, uh, coast, the New York and some uh, Philly area um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Why is this list important? Because the first three, Fink, Henderson, and Krebiel, as you can tell, they were pretty much born around the same time. They started their professional life as uh, critics around the same time, exactly at the time when there was this uh, quote unquote Germanized opera house. Also, they were either of German origins or they spent the time in Germany um, studying uh, composition, uh, singing, uh, and uh, of course studying German. So to them, opera, the, the, the class opera, was really German opera, was really the Wagner uh, repertory. And this is why the Italian opera, after enjoying so much popularity during, uh, like before, paradoxically, so the, the Italian mass migration, had such a hard time to be positively advertised in the American press. Um, Aldrich was a bit more balanced, and Smith was uh, actually 
probably the one who was most in favor of the Italians. He was actually the only one that uh, the conductor Arturo Toscanini trusted. So it was like he wouldn't really talk to the others, but he made an effort to uh, talk to them. Anyway, this said, let's go through some examples on how the American press and the Italian language press, in particular in these cases based in New York, reacted to the exact same work. So here we have uh, The Sun, so Henderson writing this repertoire. In 1913 is the 100th uh, anniversary from Verdi's birth, and Giulio Gatti Casazza, who was uh, the general manager of the Met Opera, decides uh, to uh, stage Un Ballo in Maschera. Now, as you can read there, like Mr. Caruso at his best, uh, presented with a strong cast, handsome new scenery and costumes. Now, one has to read between the lines. In other words, when a critic was not particularly appreciative of a uh, fan opera, at least the headlines uh, said something positive about uh, the performers, about the scenery, about the costume. That's to say, it was still worthy, you know, the opera itself is <laughs> well. But uh, still, as you know, the Met did a good job doing that. If you uh, dig in and you start reading at least some specific passages, let's see what happens. Bali Mascara, despite the manifold absurdities of the libretto, or it is the kind of music too which is beloved of people devoted to the elementary things in art. It's talking about the Italians. I can show, I have proof of that <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, much of the pungent early style of Verdi, the striding climaxes, the brads and uh, instrumental proclamations, so the frequently pretentious and semi martial vocal utterances remain in this work and sometimes, as in the trio of Renato, uh, and the conspirators, it comes perilously near uh, of the, mm, uh, the moving, uh, moving the moderate listeners uh, to smile, if not laughter. Okay, that's the American side. Let's see what happens in the Italian language press. Il Giornale Italiano, you can trust me, this is about the exact same performance, same day. Ballo in Maschera, Centinario di Verdi, here we go. Uh, last Saturday, we had the Bali Maschera, which uh, has drawn away an immense public of 4,000 people who gather in this religious silence in the vast hall of the Metropolitan and uh, basically through the same divine emotions of this uh, unanimous enthusiasm to which was drawn a public uh, in such a different context 54 years ago, which was the first performance uh, of uh, Ballo uh, in Maschera. Only the geniuses, Verdi, uh, destined to immortality, can make uh, this miracle possible. Is that the same performance? Yes, it is. <laughs> and this is, uh, so this like keeps happening uh, over and over and over. This is one year later in Gloria di Verdi. I don't even know if I need to translate it, but it's pretty much, uh, it's, uh, uh, so okay, this is not the same performance, but even before attendendo, so waiting in Ballo in Maschera for 1914, 1915 season, it's already the Gloria of Verdi, no matter what will happen in the performance. Uh, another example, and then we move on. So um, Umberto Giordano, composer uh, of, uh, later composer, late 19th, early 20th uh, century from the Verismo period, in 1915 comes up with this opera, Madame Saint-Jeanne, uh, set in the, um, around the Napoleonic period. Here we see a similar kind of rhetoric, the splendid cast, the great singing effect, but music in the military style, kind of you know, simple type of uh, uh, repertory. Giordano's score not above previous level, which is a kind of way to say, well, you know, he did what he could, but uh, not really a very successful opera. Giordano's score not inspiring in melody, and I pick this especially because later we're going to see something about melody in the Italian language press. Now, Italian language press, Il Mattino, Madame saint jean the immense success of uh, Umberto Giordano's work, a great Great triumph of Italian arc thanks to Gatti Casazza, the Italian general manager of the Met. This sort of rhetoric, Italian composers triumph of the Italian art was something that constantly happened over and over and over. This one is the part that I prefer. Uh, after each performance, uh, the Italian press would, in this case Il Progresso Italo Americano, would cherry pick passages from the American press taken totally out of context, I mean, you know, for instance, too, they said a positive thing. Uh, they say everything was bad except for this. And so this is, uh, and this was, um, these were articles for the uh, members of the Italian community that uh, they wanted to believe, so the, uh, the newspapers wanted them to believe that everything had gone 
great at the at the performance. So people they either could not read English or didn't bother enough. Yeah, to you know, you got to be careful because there's people in this room who who depend on that for that's great for blurbs exactly. on their books. Again, it's dimensional <laughs> 100 years ago, so it's all good. Now I'm sure that everything is uh, totally different. Actually, one thing that uh, we notice is that uh, and this is a small parenthesis, but an important one is that uh, um, opera had an importance back then only comparable to what um, Hollywood is uh, today. Like the, the amount of space, literally, that you find in both uh, um, American newspapers, Italian language newspapers, but even like German um, language newspapers, it was easily comparable to that section about uh, Hollywood actors uh, and uh, Hollywood movies, uh, with the main difference that uh, um, now we have primarily American actors uh, acting in uh, um, Hollywood movies. Back then, we were primarily having European, not only, of course, but primarily European uh, singers coming here to have success. And that indeed created the sort of uh, uh, tension that uh, yeah, I'll discuss more later, especially in connection with uh, uh, Caruso. Anyway, just a, a few um, notes just to, to, to show you how this uh, rhetoric uh, uh, changed in the Italian and uh, newspapers. So we have uh, this um, American press had the words of great enthusiasm for the opera of Maestro Giordano, uh, and they recognize, the American journalists, that Madame Saint-Jean contains wonderful pages, both for the modernity of the technique, musical techniques, and the freshness and the originality of melody, which is exactly the part that we saw earlier that uh, wasn't a terribly uh, successful one. Now, what happened when the German repertory was performed? In general, the um, uh, reviews in the Italian newspaper were not particularly positive, unless these were in the hands uh, were conducted by an Italian conductor. And this is the case of Toscanini, who, uh, so the Crepusculo degli Dei, as the last part of the uh, Götterdämmerung, the, the last part of the uh, Ring of Wagner. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Toscanini triumphs with the Crepusculo degli Dei. That is, you know, the, the triumph is thanks to the Italian uh, conductor. So there is the victory thanks to the ingenious Italian, the Metropolitan Opera. And of course, the American press is totally like agrees in admiring Toscanini, not necessarily Wagner. Uh, same story, Crepusculo degli Dei. L'arte tedesca, the German art triumphs in the hands of an Italian. Before Toscanini, not as much. <laughs> um, finally, what happened with the American composers. Uh, this is very interesting because, in general, it's true that American opera has not been uh, uh, as successful, not here in the US, uh, uh, not, not even here in the US as much the Italian, the French, and the German repertory. But there was, in general, a movement uh, of uh, um, American critics who wanted more American opera, or at least uh, uh, foreign opera performed in English, but also they wanted some American composers being staged the matter. So this is um, drawing is part of this rhetoric where someone that says, oh, we don't want opera in French, in Italian, in German, we really want it in vernacular that is in, uh, in English. At one point, Giulio Gatti Casazza sort of gives in to this uh, uh, pressure and agrees to uh, to stage an opera by Horacio Parker, um, an uh, American composer who was teaching then at uh, Yale, so one of the most uh, uh, prestigious, and uh, he agrees to uh, stage this opera, uh, Mona, M-O-N-A, uh, at the Met, with an expense of about $40,000, which translates, in nowadays dollar, about $1 million, so a major performance. See how the Italian press reacts to that. L'Opera Nuova del Maestro, Horacio Parker, Mona, that is $40,000 thrown at sea. Uh, just to see how welcome you know, the, the American press was uh, um, toward uh, this uh, uh, new, uh, this uh, American uh, repertory. Um, I also thought, uh, as a uh, final point, to, to, to briefly um, discuss something, because this year is the 100th anniversary of the first performance of Puccini Il Tritico, it is a series of three short operas that again, were premiered here in uh, 1918, here in the US, at the Met in 1918, and pretty much we followed a similar kind of rhetoric, great artistic uh, events at the Metropolitan Opera House, uh, three new operas. The um, American press uh, was a bit more skeptical in the sense that uh, they remembered the Puccini of Tosca, Madame Butterfly, um, so like the, the, the great successes he had in the late 19th, early 20th century. But they were not terribly happy with these new operas because it was missing this uh, bel canto, this beautiful singing uh, uh, type uh, of uh, 
uh, style and need only the last one of this trittico de Gianni Schicchi, which is like you know, the, 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 the comic opera with uh, the Omio Babino Caro, the famous aria, was the one that uh, was appreciated overall. Otherwise, uh, it's uh, powerfully in conception, but melody quality is not ingratiating, except again for uh, before this uh, last, uh, uh, last one. So that's. Uh, and then uh, I would say that uh, maybe a few words about Caruso is probably worthy um, in the sense that uh, we think of Caruso as these uh, hero figures, uh, the one that was able to bring together the Italian communities and the Americans, and everybody was happy with him, and he was a great uh, figure that everybody agreed upon. Not as much, or better, some of the um, aspects that I will mention here are relatively well known, but they certainly deserve a closer look uh, to um, show a different side of Caruso, or better, a different side of Caruso and how he was perceived by the American press. So here I'm showing the, the again, right, what we know about Caruso, grandiose event of Italinar. Caruso stands there uh, in the middle between Toscanini and Gatti Casazza. This was the first, the first performance of uh, Aida at the Met. Um, just a few quotes from Il Progresso. Il divo Caruso in Ponchielis Gioconda uh, carries away the auditorium to the delirium. And then uh, uh, this uh, another title that proves how Italians knew of Caruso even before he came to, um, to New York. Conrad was actually the impresario, uh, the one who ran the Met, who brought uh, Caruso to uh, the Met. Here is Caruso uh, in Little Italy, uh, you know, with his uh, people around uh, to care of, uh, um, to care of him. Um, how do we know this is Little Italy? Well, um, uh, that echo Caruso there at, uh, at the top uh, is clearly like uh, um, uh, sound or Neapolitan uh, accent, which has this uh, um, phenomenon of, it's called the uh, apocope, I think in English, uh, A-P-O, um, C-O-P-E, uh, and it's pretty much like dropping uh, through a process of elision the last uh, uh, vowel of the word. It's like a typical element of uh, the uh, dialect of the Neapolitan in particular, and we know that Neapolitans um, were like a prominent in the uh, Little Italy. So all these uh, uh, drawings, you know, they're, they're kind of nice, you know, with Caruso eating the spaghetti, and so ah, I know, I know, eh, they're just, you know, like the, the corpulent Caruso, as, well as it was, eh, and we also know that, you know, he liked the spaghetti, the lamb, the mussel, so it's all good, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, drawings uh, uh, which I find uh, quite, you know, nice and funny and just, uh, what I find much more disturbing, and here I need to open a little, uh, well, there's not really a print, it's, it's a fact, it was the, the monkey house scandal. What was this monkey house scandal? Um, Caruso came here to this country in 1903, uh, had a great success at the beginning, and in 1906, he was uh, uh, convicted, essentially, for molestation, for uh, inappropriately touching a, a woman at this, uh, the um, Bronx uh, Zoo in uh, New York. He professed his innocence. Uh, this woman said, no, he actually did, uh, did that uh, to me. In the end of this uh, very disturbing story, he was uh, uh, convicted, but with a fine that was uh, basically a joke of $10, the equivalent of $250 nowadays, someone who earn $5 million a season, it was pretty much nothing. So it's pretty much the worst possible decision because on the one hand, uh, he was convicted as guilty for something that he always said, I didn't do it. And this poor woman pretty much, uh, so this guy kind of uh, walking away, if that was true, uh, it's you know, like basically doing a great injustice to her. Stanley Jackson wrote this uh, biography. He's not a musicologist, he's uh, a uh, lawyer, and uh, this book is from 1972, and this is the first part how he describes that happening. Caruso denied pinching the woman or even touching her. He asserts that he, she smiled at him and he had to smile back politely. Surprisingly, she was not called as a witness, and uh, basically because this woman said, uh, well, uh, Caruso's friends are uh, uh, dangerous. Now, before I show you next, uh, um, next image, another quote from this book, uh, Keep in mind that this is a book, if not like totally scholarly book, but a book written by this lawyer and published by a very well respected um, New York publisher. So something that after all passed supposedly a peer review process. Here is what this person says, 1972. 
Fondling or tweaking a lady's behind was and remains so prevalent, a male pastime in Italy and Latin America, that he, Caruso, might well have taken instinctively and without considering it more than a playful kiss. Now, why do I show this, this obscenity over here? If this was the kind of rhetoric that still happened in 1972, in a, let's call it a scholarly book, can you imagine what kind of rhetoric, what was going on in you know, people just talking to each other in 1906? It was the kind of rhetoric they brought to this. Caruso is offered a bodyguard by Sicilian relatives. They have the monkey that says foil, so coat, and Caruso between the, the two Sicilians with the ready with the knives to stab, I guess, anyone who you know, could potentially threat his reputation. By the way, um, the dates say 1907, I'm sorry, like it's 1906, of course, right after the event. So in a sense, again, like it's out of this event, which uh, everyone later, the press, uh, the Italian American community, the Met, they all try to swipe uh, uh, like uh, behind the, 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 the... Under the rug. Under the rug, thank you, that's the expression. It really came to the worst possible outcome for the reasons I said before, and because of course uh, this brought this uh, series of drawings, I just picked one, but there are many others, uh, against the uh, Italian community of, uh, um, of New York, and this is again an, an event that was very uh, disturbing that is certainly not uh, discussed as much as it was back then, but it certainly it's something that uh, brought a blue, not only on uh, Caruso reputation, again, it, it should have had some neg very negative consequences on him if this had happened, but more in general, all the Italian community had, uh, had not um, much to do with that. Um, Caruso, also the greedy singer, that is, as I said earlier, a lot of these singers were as popular as uh, uh, actors in uh, these days. Uh, so a lot of the American newspapers uh, uh, thought of these singers, and Caruso more than others, because he was the one uh, who made more money than um, anyone else, uh, depicting him as the one who was uh, only interested in dollars. Uh, their um, newspapers uh, showed uh, much all the earnings of these people. Um, Caruso, uh, so the 200 thousand, as I said earlier, translates roughly into the five million per season uh, nowadays. And finally, well, uh, is this funny? I don't think that much, but let me give you a context. At some point, um, Caruso was asked by the uh, Italian-American mafia to pay a certain uh, amount of money. He initially agreed for a, a lower amount. When they asked for more, he reported that to the police, and so these people were um, um, brought uh, to to, to, to court and eventually jailed. Uh, that hand was uh, actually, many people confuse here the so-called the black hand, the mano nera, with the Italian American mafia, but in reality, the black hand was like uh, how the mafia sent these letters with these uh, uh, like hands and very often uh, um, with a knife as well to threat the people in order to make uh, them uh, pay. And so all these um, American newspapers, once Caruso denounced this fact uh, and he was protected by the police everywhere. And so they, they tried to be funny with the, 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 the police uh, singing in the background while uh, uh, he's uh, clearly performing in Rigoletto, you know, the, the Duke of Mantua. Uh, this is another example. Caruso caged uh, during the performance and again, all the, the police with the guns. So is this funny? Well, I mean, if you look at this like that, okay, it's funny. But I mean, it's funny if it doesn't touch you personally. Many people in, in the, the, the Italian-American uh, community were unfortunately touched by this uh, phenomenon. And so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, funny in a sense, but also disturbing on uh, the other. In the end, when we talk about Caruso, I think we are talking about a uh, performer that for the Americans overall, it wasn't really um, a threatening figure among this uh, community of uh, Italians that uh, um, here to the US. But he was not, uh, as well as were not uh, the Italians who performed on stage when someone like Giulio Catechazzo was asked to actually run a, a opera house, well, we'll see what happened. And uh, I'd like to kill, close this part with this uh, funny video of Caruso trying to ingratiate himself for the American audience uh, by making this face. It kind of gives us a sense uh, of uh, uh, yeah, how, <laughs> of these uh, very expressive faces that he, did, he made on, uh, on stage. So the, you know, the Kluge Center, as, as many people in the room know, but perhaps not everybody, that we will have at any given time, you know, we could have as many as 30 scholars in residence is about what we have right now. And, and there's, a, you know, of course, a lot of interaction that's part of the point. 
And what we hear from this gentleman is, is a conversation about, hey, I'm finding these autobiographies of Italian immigrants, and, and that's you know, an important part of his research. And uh, I was hoping that you could speak to how, that is, how these autobiographies are, are informing uh, your research into uh, the perception of Italian opera by mm -hmm. Italian Yeah, no, absolutely. I would say this was one of the three most important uh, outcomes of this research in my time uh, here. Um, what I'm going to do is going to show a few uh, quotes and then explain why these quotes in particular are so important. Pascal D'Angelo, someone who became a very well-respected uh, um, um, author, writer, and poet here in the U.S., describes in this autobiography of him as an immigrant to the U.S., uh, eventually becoming uh, again, a successful writer, how he discovered opera. And this story is it's very common among Italians. So he says that during the summer of 1919, I began to hear much about the Aida, so where this Aida, but he did not know exactly what it was. So Federico, a friend of him um, uh, up to the Hudson Heights, uh, had uh, been to see it, but he was unable to tell me much about it except that there was a fine parade in it, which is, of course, the Triumphal March in <laughs> Act Two. So about the same time, I happened to glance over an Italian newspaper, that's you know, how Italian can learn about the opera, and saw an advertisement that this opera was uh, be represented in open air at the uh, Sheepshed Bay Rack racetrack. I decided to go and hear it, and I went by asking my way, so basically the intricacies of Brooklyn, and then I heard these supreme melodies around me. I felt the impulse to rush home uh, to our boxcar and compose another uh, even though I didn't know much about uh, music. And indeed, if you don't know music, it's kind of difficult to write something like Aida. Uh, in this autobiography, he eventually keeps trying, he fails, and that's how he decides to become a poet. Of course, not high <laughs> respect to the poets, but of course, he had to change a um, uh, career. Uh, Jerry Mangione, also very well respected um, Italian American uh, scholar, uh, describes something from uh, his own personal life that is this Caluzzo, the very fiend of a second cousin who played opera after opera opera on an asthmatic uh, phonograph. By the way, in the other room, uh, we have uh, artifacts, uh, we have books, um, scores, and a phonograph, which to take a look later. He must have had an extraordinary ear for music, because the blare of the children and the thunderous blasphemy usually coincided with the climaxes of uh, Aida, Trovatore, or Rigoletto, the operas he favored the most. All of them, of course, were this opera. Last example, oh, by uh, Giulia Volpeletto, describing uh, uh, her grandfather. When the Progresso Italo Americano reported a particular success at the Metropolitan Opera House, he, her grandfather, would buy a recording of his favorite arias sung by his favorite artists, Giovanni Martinelli, Gigli, Poncella, uh, Caruso, and then she described how she learned about opera. Now, why are these passages so uh, important? Why do I pick them? Well, one talks about Italians going to the opera, that is, attending the opera live, and, as I'll show later, sticking all together in order to support their performers. The other, the one in the middle, is about the private enjoyment of opera, having a um, uh, phonograph and basically having the operas performed there as a sort of collective, um, as a sonic experience, as a collective right, even during you know, the normal situation with children running and so on. And the other is about Italians reading the Italian-American newspapers and learning through them about uh, these uh, operatic performances. So um, we all knew that that happened. But uh, what this experience here at Kluge allowed me was the time to find um, plenty of evidence. Obviously, I limited it to three, but yeah, I found uh, uh, dozens. Uh, my friend Catherine knew because uh, it's when we were, on the, we were on the opposite side, so we were on the very close in our cubicles, and every time I would find, I was like, ha-ha, and she knew that uh, <laughs> I had found uh, a, new, a new one. I was actually there when uh, this happened. Now, an, another very compelling evidence that I found was images of Italians going to the opera. And here we go. So, uh, well, the one they're seeing is clearly the corpulent uh, Caruso. This is from the Chicago Daily News from 1910. And up there, we have these very moved Italians. So I know how they are Italians. So in a moment, like even crying, of course, the seats were very cheap, but very much into the performance. And we see at uh, the bottom, like the most expensive seat, the other seats that we know that were the areas 
were the wealthiest Americans sometimes, the, those who literally own the opera house. I, I, I don't care that much. You know, just, <laughs> oh, yeah, this guy performing whatever he's doing. We don't know. But it's, it's, you know, it's kind of funny to see this contrast. Now, um, another evidence, uh, 1908, this is the Manhattan Opera House. Um, this is a performance of uh, Tetrazzini. And here is the close-up with the gallery, not uh, the Italian. And uh, the, uh, again, like the, the title, as I showed earlier, it's uh, with, with Italy, only Italians that gathered up there, presumably right after a performance, an aria of uh, Tetrazzini, all very like, overexcited uh, and very happy that she did a great uh, um, performance. And this is supposedly your average Italian uh, reacting to an uh, Italian performer. Apparently, uh, like some uh, prima donna caught in a Sicilian music uh, mirror from New York Herald. So Traviata enters, uh, the rest of the, well, the rest of it is never really the most exciting part. Ah, she's flat. Oh, well, <laughs> the descending scale. And then she's above the staff, the color notes. Uh, well, clearly, about the, the final uh, embellishment. And the brava, brava. So, I mean, this uh, sort of uh, presumably describes uh, this uh, very happy Italian at the uh, uh, performance. This one um, is supposedly uh, the Metropolitan Opera House. Um, and uh, um, uh, so this, this is something that has already been published in, uh, in a book. And uh, according to the caption of this book, uh, this is a drawing that Toscanini's son uh, did while being at the Met Opera. Now, um, I had a chance once to talk to Toscanini's grandson, who could have told me more about it. Unfortunately, I didn't have the chance to talk in detail, and unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago, but we trust this book that uh, this is exactly what happened. Okay, more images about Italians. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe I should briefly read this, uh, and then we move on to something else. So yeah. this is uh, um, how the uh, Musical America described the Italians being, staying at the opera in 1909. They came up from the Little Italy on the east side, where the Met Opera is. They came up from the Terra degli Spaghetti on the west side, and they crowded into the Met Opera Monday night till they stood four and five deep in the parterre and jammed up the gallery, up there. They had uh, come to welcome the uh, great compatriot Caruso, and they were prepared to stop the action of the opera when he appeared on the stage and shout bis, etc., etc. So the point that this article makes, essentially, the Italians only know one kind of music, and they show up for their own, um, their own operas. In a sense, this sort of uh, um, makes it uh, even more compelling, the argument I made earlier, that uh, we were moving from class to race or ethnicity, because uh, this kind of rhetoric, even though it was not uh, so clearly uh, phrased, but it happened for the Germans as well, for the Czechs as well, for all those immigrants who, uh, night by night, filled the upper part, that is the, the least expensive part, of the uh, Met Opera. And again, other evidence of the, this one, for example, is the Boston, the Boston uh, Opera House. Uh, it's something that uh, further proves this point. Finally, uh, I would like to discuss a bit, and so we at least we listen some music uh, on uh, how um, opera was uh, popularized. Opera was popularized, of course, uh, through this aria recorded and then uh, being uh, uh, like you know sold in these phonographs. But also a key element that we often forgot nowadays was the band culture. In, uh, was so popular in the US. It was, of course, in Italy. So the Italians recreated these bands here in the US. See, here we have the citizen uh, associations. This one was in Oswego, New York, uh, Pueblo, Colorado. This was the Giuseppe Creatore band in uh, Boston. And all these uh, um, band conductors, in order to, uh, to have success, basically, to, to sell their recordings, they started um, transcribing passages from operas, duet, arias, and so on. And I have selected a couple to just show you how incredibly identical they were. So they literally transcribed the duet, the aria, uh, for these bands. So Italians could enjoy either the original or the band copy. Um, this one is from Verdi, La Forza del Destino, uh, where uh, Don, the dying Don, uh, Don Alvaro talked to Don Carlos. I'll be happy to say more something about the plot, but just pay attention to the melody. Oh, 
And here is the transcription of Oreste Vesselas, uh, one of the most famous band uh, conductors. The duet between trombone and the baritone chord. Literally identical. And here's another one. I put the subtitles here. Uh, so <laughs> just uh, something. And thank you, Andrew, for helping me with uh, this uh, <laughs> this uh, uh, video. So this is Rizzetti uh, um, Lucia de Lammermoor in the mad uh, scene. Again, one minute, and uh, then we're gonna play the other version. It's <laughs> obviously Natalie the same. And here is Santi uh, Taffarella performing the same exact passage. And she, of course, she just uh, killed the man she didn't uh, want to uh, marry, Arturo. And she's uh, imagining uh, to, to that uh, now, even though she has gone mad, to marry the beloved uh, Edgardo. And so here is Santi Taffarella uh, at the cornet uh, performing the same. Yeah, and uh, this is really a type of um, repertory that uh, maybe you has not really investigated as much as it should, uh, and uh, yeah, definitely a good uh, step ahead in the future. Well, D Davide, um, thank you very much. This was extraordinarily interesting. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, yeah. We appreciate your efforts. <laughs> thank you. This is in finishing okay. with the beautiful music is perfect. Uh, please join me in uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanking you. Thanks. Um, we have it. We have it. Uh, a reception back here, uh, wine, beer, etc., and and some some uh, other appetizers. Uh, you're not allowed to bring them back into the collections, but uh, please do check out the collections in the back. Um, I want to alert you to two things before I set you free, and I you know the seatbelt sign comes off, and that is that uh, we have a, an event next two, next Thursday at two o'clock on the Bible in American Life with uh, Mark Knoll and Lincoln Mullen, who are historians of the Bible. I think you'll find it interesting. It sits 2 o'clock right here in this room. And then, just to put on your calendar going forward, we have uh, July 19, uh, the Restoring the American Dream, which is part of our Daniel Inouye Institute lecture series. Uh, Ann Compton will be moderating a conversation with two authors and columnists, Ross Douthat of the New York Times and uh, E.J. Dion of the Washington Post. 
and the, and the, the first event next week is at 3 o'clock, not 2 o'clock. The Inouye lecture is at 6.30, so that's an evening event. But uh, again, thank you for your attendance, and you'll have an opportunity to, to, uh, to chat with Dr. Seriani at the reception. Thanks. Oh, this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.